I was rather startled. Here's the letter. My dear Norman, I've now got myself into the kind of trouble that I've always considered to be quite a possibility for me, though I've usually rated it at about ten to one against. I shall shortly be pleading guilty to a charge of sexual offences with a young man. The story of how it all came to be found out is a long and fascinating one, which I shall have to make into a short story one day, but I haven't time to tell you now. No doubt I shall emerge from it all a different man, but quite who, I have not found out. I am rather afraid that the following syllogism may be used by some in the future. Turing believes that machines think. Turing lies with men. Therefore, machines do not think. Yours in distress, Alan. Well, it was quite a story. In November 1951, Alan Turing finished his first big paper in mathematical biology, and he felt very proud and pleased at having got this out of the way. And I think it was then he decided to give himself a little bit of a, a break. And in December, he met a young man on the Oxford Road in Manchester, a chap called Arnold, who, uh, well, after a little bit of getting to know each other, Alan invited back to his house. And uh, there began a, a relationship, which had its uh, ups and downs, and there were difficulties in it. Arnold, unfortunately, had been rather boasting his relationship with this very impressive chap who told him about working on the electronic brain, all these things in Manchester University, and uh, had let a mate of his see Alan's address on a letter that he was sending to him. And this other chap, uh, Harry, went and burgled Turing's house. And then there was the whole story about the, um, the police. He, in his innocence, uh, because he was a total innocent, in his innocence went to the police when uh, 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 his young friend had said he perhaps knew who had done it, and said, oh, I know who's done it. And the police, of course, were interested in knowing how he got this information, and it was all uh, um, pulled out of him. Anybody more sophisticated and more, uh, more knowledge of the world would realize that that was what was going to happen. He told me about it, and then and, and he complained a bit about the way the police tried to catch him out and so on. Then he said, well, you see, and then they, they made a transcript of our interview, and he said, of course, it was a total caricature, but it wasn't totally inaccurate. For example, he said, telling, I was having an affair with him. Question, what sort of an affair? Answer on the typescript. Swas on nerf, interquerable friction and mutual masturbation. <laughs> and Terry roared with laughter. <laughs> well, Turing was certainly very averse to showing any kind of dishonesty or shame or anything else, anything other than clarity, if he could help it. And perhaps overcompensating for his little fib, uh, really made a very full statement about exactly what had happened between Ar him and Arnold. And after he'd done that, he had no choice, and he was clearly guilty of all that he was charged with as a result. Turing had been given an OBE in recognition of his secret wartime work, though no one, of course, could say what it was for. He had also been consulted on occasion by British intelligence. Hugh Alexander, top scientific officer at GCHQ, appeared in camera as a character witness for Turing. He told me two things that amused me. One was that um, when he was talking to Turing beforehand, Turing brought out a file of everything he had about it, and on the on outside of the file, in large letters, burglary and buggery, because there'd been a burglary which had given rise to the uh, incident. And uh, the other thing was, he said to Alexander, uh, I've probably got the figures wrong, but the, rel rel the relativity is correct. He said, you know, the worst I can get for what I've done is seven years, but if I'd buggered a sheep, it might be ten. And he cackled. <laughs> he had to have psychological treatment, I believe, and certainly he had to have hormone therapy. And I well remember him describing to me with giggles the effect that it was having on him, namely it was causing him to grow breaths. When he was convicted of homosexuality, um, this put him beyond the pale as far as government employment in secret work was concerned, because of course they'd always bothered about um, blackmail, that sort of thing. 
and uh, you wouldn't get a PV certificate, positive vetting certificate, if you were a convicted uh, or even thought to be a homosexual. The whole ordeal seems to have left Turing unrepentant. In 1953, he went on holiday in Norway, where he'd heard there were dances for men only. He was now under police surveillance. My dear Norman, thanks for your letter. I should have answered it earlier. I have a delightful story to tell you of my adventurous life when we next meet. I've had another round with the gendarme, and it's round two to Turing. Half the police of Northern England, by one report, were out searching for a supposed boyfriend of mine. It was all a mare's nest. Perfect virtue and chastity had governed all our proceedings. But the poor sweeties never knew this. A very light kiss beneath a foreign flag under the influence of drink was all that had ever occurred. Being on probation, my shining virtue was terrific and had to be. If I had so much as parked my bicycle on the wrong side of the road, there might have been 12 years for me. No time to write about logic now, love, Alan. Turing spent more and more time at home, working hard on mathematical biology. No one who knew him was prepared for what happened next. It was the 8th of June, 1954. At about five o'clock in the afternoon, Alan Turing's housekeeper came here with shopping to cook his dinner and she saw immediately something very strange, all the lights in the house were on. She went in, went upstairs to find him and there he was dead in bed. He must have died during the holiday weekend. There was a strong chemical smell in the room which was later identified as, as cyanide and by his bedside there was a half-eaten apple. Some people have suspected that the Secret Service may have at least encouraged him to commit suicide. And that there's even a slight suspicion, apparently, in some circles, that they, they might have contrived to murder him on the grounds that he was too big a security risk, that he knew so much, and yet he would go abroad to see some young man. I could imagine them being quite nervous about that. But somehow it seems to me to be far-fetched. Turing's mother never accepted the official verdict. There was no suicide note, he was notoriously careless, and he had been amusing himself with a chemistry experiment involving potassium cyanide. His mother wrote to me, and she said that although it was a verdict of suicide, she believed in accident. And of course, um, his method was chosen to make it possible for some, at least, to believe that. I mean, you're interested in the reason for his suicide. Um, some people say it's because he was totally bored with being watched by the police, but I have a feeling it was tied up with his knowledge that mathematics is a young man's game, and that in his mid-forties, which I think he was, um, he was never going to make another earth-shaking discovery like his famous computable numbers. A lot of people, of course, want to try and trace reasons. Why did you do that? Now, I think it's an insult to human beings to suppose that one can write out reasons for everything they do. I should be very annoyed if someone tried to explain my conduct <laughs> in terms of serious logical steps. People do inexplicable things. I think it's important to remember that. But the second thing was, I did already know that he had discussed ways of committing suicide with two other people I knew. They said, they both said, well, we weren't sure whether this was just a, a, an interesting intellectual exercise or whether it was something serious. Well, it, it turned out that this went back a long way, and obviously the suicidal impulse was something which came up every now and then. Alan Turing was cremated on the 12th of June, 1954, and his ashes scattered in the gardens of Woking Crematorium. There is no memorial. <laughs>